Hey y'all. So today I'm going to talk about narcissistic abuse, not feeling safe. So we know kids come into this world very dependent on their caregivers. They need assistance from food, water, clothes, shelter, medical care, you name it, a kid needs it. They can't do anything in this world by themselves. So they're dependent on their caregivers to get everything that they need because if not, the kid would just die. So they know that, hey, I need some other people. If I'm going to be safe, if I'm going to get my needs met in this world, I need to depend on whoever that is that's giving me this care. So if there comes a point when a child begins to grow up and they learn that their parents or caregivers are not giving them what they need, the child begins to not feel so safe in this world because they're like, wow, the ones that were supposed to give me support, that were supposed to nurture me, that were supposed to feed me and care for me, it's not there as I need it. So this is what I'm going to talk about. So hold on here with me. I'm going to talk about uh, some personal times where I didn't feel safe in my household and give you some stories of mine. So feel free to leave your comments in the section below. All right. So as a young child, I would say that when it was just me and my mom, my mom to me was just the best person ever. You know, I was the only child. Uh, she took several, had several companies come out to take pictures of me. She played with me. She was supportive with me. You know, I might get a s occasional spanking if I did something wrong. Hey, no problems there. That was common. And sometimes I deserved a little spanking, you know. So, you know, but she was someone I felt safe with because she was nurturing and, you know, I could go to her if I hurt myself to get a hug and know that she was there for me and know that she wasn't going to allow people to harm me. But the thing was, is that when she got pregnant, um, I was six years old. She got pregnant with my second sister. I started to notice that things changed. You know, she started to become a little bit critical when she was pregnant and she started comparing me to other people like, Hey, your friend here can jump on the, um, on this uh, thing here, this swing, and she can swing higher than you, or she can turn backflips. How come you can't? And you know, and I would get upset, but you know, this was still my super mom. So I was like, oh, okay, that's different. But anyway, you know, I just kept going on. But as soon as my mother actually had my second sister, it totally changed. So it went from this uh, uh, supportive, loving mom to this person who I didn't know, who was constantly going from zero to a hundred real quick, screaming at the top of her lungs and yelling, embarrassing me in public, telling anyone who would listen that old Samira is not smart in school, she's not doing well, she got a D in art class, and she can't mix colors, and it was like, I was, I was sensitive, and so she would always tell people these things, whoever would listen, so I would cry a lot, like always thinking, dang, there was nothing that I could have that was myself, that couldn't be, that, that it was just in our house household. I was told to keep everything in the household to let it stay there. It was nobody's business, but she was allowed to go out and tell everybody everything as it related to me. So I couldn't do anything without it being the center of attention because you know narcs like to have uh, be the center of attention. So she would use me as the one um, that she would embarrass me to make herself look good and have everyone laughing and hearing her talk about um, how just how basically how horrible I was and it just caused the big entertainment and the big spectacle but at my expense so I didn't feel safe and I really didn't like going so much around the family because um, instead of people you know saying hey maybe that's not so appropriate which Sometimes there were a few people who did say that, but people were laughing and egging her on. Woo, tell that story, girl. Oh, you know how to tell the story. Oh, my goodness. So Myra did what? Oh, my God. So it just brought all this narcissistic supply, all that attention that my mother was needing. And she made really good use of it. But what it taught me is that I couldn't be safe. I couldn't tell her certain things. I couldn't rely on her because I knew that she wouldn't um, hold those things, that whatever I said could come back to slap me in the face and it would be um, a source of her attention before other people. So I was like, yeah, some things I couldn't tell her. Even though she would tell me, hey, if you ever do something horrible, you come and you tell me the truth and then you let me tell the story to the police or anybody else. But then I used to think when she would say that, like, I don't 
trust you. I don't feel safe around you. You sometimes side with my enemies. So why would I come and tell you some dirt that I've done? Because you might side with the police and say, yeah, Samira so was just never about anything. And I just don't know where she comes from and where she gets this and that from. I wouldn't have felt safe to do those things. Well, um, one thing that I like to get into is that um, how I used to cope uh, with not feeling safe. You know, I would try to escape on the weekends. You know, I look forward to any weekend, any holiday. And as my mother had um, eventually had another child, sometimes I would have to take them with me because she didn't really want to be bothered with them either. So I had to parent her children. But anyway, I had to take them with me, but at least we could escape for the weekend, you know. And even though I escaped, I had some places that I really liked to go. But looking back, some of those places weren't the best. You know, I might have had a um, a friend's parent or um, step parent or whatever that was on drugs. And my mother knew about that. So, you know, this is what I mean about not feeling so safe. I know I would have pouted and cried if she said I couldn't go back over the house. But that's the thing. If you're a parent, you have to know that, hey, even if your child pouts and cries, that some environments are not best. So I was going over... Uh, people you know a person's house and not that she let me go over a lot of people's house but there was just certain people but we knew that um one parent or so was on drugs and on drugs very bad you know out there on the streets and you know just bad situations but I was just trying to do anything to get out of the house you know um also a way I coped with not feeling safe at the home is that I wanted to be rescued. My father was in my life from, from what I recall, me being a child until I was about six. When she had my second uh, sister, we don't have the same father. My father ended up leaving. Uh, last time I remember him, he had missed my, I believe it was my sixth birthday. He came a few days later. I quizzed him. Hey, do you know what you missed? And he's like, you know, he had no idea. I had to tell him it was my birthday. So you see the father situation wasn't much better, but anyway, he, um, he had left. So I, um, as I got older, I wanted him to come back and rescue me because she wasn't treating me bad when he was around. So I'm like, maybe he could come back and get me out of this situation. Maybe I could go live with him. But then once I realized that he didn't care about me either because he was gone, he didn't write a note. You know, our phone number stayed the same up until I was an adult. We didn't move. The address was the same. I know he moved to a different state, but if he had wanted to find contact with me, he would have found me. So I realized that I had no luck with him. He was not coming to save me. Eventually that um, need, that want, that feeling of wanting to be saved by him turned into resentment, thinking like, why would you leave me here with this woman? I uh, didn't he see, you know, the kind of person that she would eventually come out to be where well, there are not any red flags. Why leave your child with someone like a bully like this? Because that's what she was, a, a bully who got off on seeing me cry and seeing me scared. You know, if she saw that, it was, I'll give you something to cry about. Or do you want me to smack you? And I had to respond. One time I tried to, I didn't say anything. I didn't respond when I was 18. I figured F you and your smack, you know. But, um, so I was like, I'm not saying anything. Then she charged after me and hurt her, hurt her knee. So she, she tried to slap me, but she couldn't. Because I was still supposed to say, when she would say, so Myra, do you want me to slap you? I was supposed to say no but at the age of 18 I said I thought to myself fuck that I'm no more responding I just looked at her so at that time it was like do what you're gonna do but I'm not responding to that damn question again okay all right so I also as a way to cope I went into books I found my mother's uh, stash of old Stephen King books and V.C. Andrews flowers under the attic so I wanted to read those books and I read every book that she had because it helped me to um, escape my life so I could pretend that I was those characters or I could get involved in those characters you know something and get involved in TV shows anything to get myself from thinking about the hell hole that I was living it living in in a daily basis Basis. I also, uh, like I said, would hope that some family members would rescue me. I'm forever uh, thankful for this one cousin when um, she would come around. I wouldn't see her maybe once a year, but my mother would say something and start going off on me and start, you know, talking um, 
talking just really crazy about me saying negative things, calling me names. And my cousin would, would be like the only one who would stand up to my mother and tell her, hey, leave her alone. You know, why are you bothering her? And my cousin would always come up. She was an older cousin, actually older than my mother. So she was like my um, second cousin or whatever. So she would hug me or say nice things to me. And it really made me feel good. Like, wow, somebody is standing up to the big bad bully. You know, somebody actually, you know, cares and is bold enough to say, no, look, this is wrong. All right. And so uh, some other ways that I think when children, when they don't feel safe, I'm going to talk about some of the symptoms that they may exhibit just mainly depression or anxiety. So uh, someone that's depressed, you know, they may uh, go around feeling sad. You know, they don't smile a lot. They might not have interest in activities that they used to. So the kid might have been big and playing basketball, but now they don't want to play basketball. Or the kid might have been good as, a, um, as an art student, but now they don't want to go to any art shows anymore. So they're just pulling back from things. They might even start um, abusing themselves, such as cutting themselves and, you know, because they got so much pain on the inside or thoughts of suicide or feeling life is hopeless and that they'll, their situation that's so toxic and unsafe would never change, you know. So those are just some of the symptoms of depression. I was not depressed. I was anxious. So um, as when my mother had my second sister, as I said, it was a the trauma was that my mother had changed how she was tre treating me. Now, I know looking back, of course, things change when there's another child. But as far as it going from a healthy, stable home to a verbally abusive home, that was traumatic for me. So one way I dealt with it, I was hypervigilant, always feeling jumpy, uneasy in the inside, like my stomach always. Always felt like they say you know having butterflies in your stomach I didn't feel um safe or I didn't know when my mother would go off like for instance if I didn't make the bottle right or if I didn't put the um the diaper on correctly or one thing that stood out for me um these little white hard shoes my mother had for my baby sister I couldn't get it on her feet and I was trying to tell my mother, I can't get it on. You know, she's moving. And plus the shoe, it was like hard to put on. And my mother screaming, you're the oldest child. Make her do. You make her do what you tell her. You're in control. You're in charge. You tell her. And I'm like six, like, dude, thinking I can't get this freaking shoe on her. And then my mother, she'll be screaming like, I'll slap the shit out of you if you can't get that shoe on. So I'm sure I eventually got the shoe on with the, the threat of slapping the shit out of me. But, you know, so things like that, Um, I what how I cope with that is I developed trichlomania. At the time, I didn't know it was trichlomania. My mother didn't know it was trichlomania. If the doctor knew, she didn't say. I found out as I be, um, became an adult and was reading psychology books that it was trichlomania. Trichlomania is like people pulling hair um, from parts of their body. So in the back of my head somewhere, um, when I was so anxious, I would start pulling out my hair in a spot. And the thing with the trichlomania is I would get this sensation to pull out the hair. So if I didn't pull it out, it was this sensation in my scalp is the best way I could feel it, making me feel like I had to pull out the hair. So I would keep pulling it out. And eventually I, my mother found out about it excuse me, and she took me to the doctor, and they gave me some ointment, some salve, and it sunk real bad. I put it on the spot a few times, but I didn't like this, the stuff in the, um, the salve, so I made myself stop pulling out my hair, you know, but even though I kept feeling the sensation, I would make myself stop, so I don't think we even needed a refill, but you know, I also started um, peeling the skin from my fingers, like from here to here, just peeling the skin off, you know, and a lot of times I wouldn't, I would just do it. I wouldn't know why, you know, my fingers would bleed like here, they would start bleeding and I just had the urge. I just needed to peel or I would constantly bite my fingers or um, break off my fingernails. You know, it was always some anxious response. And when my mother would see me do those things, she'll tell me, um, she would say to me that I, I was born anxious, that I had anxious tendencies then. Oh, Samira, uh, you came out the womb anxious. She would tell me that my father used to yell at her a lot when um, she was pregnant and that that was the reason that I came out anxious. But the thing was, when I was younger up until um, six, I didn't, I don't recall having any of those anxious um, symptoms. I remember having them all 
after the age of six that that started changing, that I didn't feel safe any longer. But according to her, it was due to my father. I believe she knew that that was a bunch of bull because narcissists, they know what they're doing and they don't like to look at themselves and to say, uh, to analyze themselves. So of course she had to blame someone else why I had a ton of anxious um, symptoms at such a young age. All right. So also just some unsafe situations. I noticed too, and this is a part you really want to hang on. So hold on in here with me. Uh, unsafe situations that narcissists will put you in because they like the drama. They like chaos around them or for whatever reasons, just not being, um, not making wise decisions, not being so smart sometimes, you know, uh, for, for one thing, uh, my second grade teacher, I was probably about eight. You know, very strict man. You know, if you get a math problem wrong, any type of problem wrong, the um he would handle that by giving you a paddle. So it was okay to paddle kids with a big wooden paddle. So um he would paddle me and the other students as well. Well, the thing was he would paddle me so hard I would wet my pants. And it used to happen so much because I wasn't doing well in school. So I would be constantly get paddles. And so, of course, people were um, shaming me because I had peed my pants and everything. And, you know, big puddles of pee on the floor. I'm not talking about little accident. I'm talking about totally let go of my bladder. You know, with no change of clothes and would just have to sit there and let my clothes air, the piss air dry in my clothes. And, you know, um... I never talked to my mother about that because for some reason I was embarrassed and didn't want to tell her. I can't, that's the only th reason I can look back to say I didn't tell her. So, um, he would also tell me and other people in the class, um, some country saying, I'm probably saying it wrong, something about you're stupid as a bag of beans. You know, there would be some parents to come up to the school and go off on him because he had beat their kids. I even heard um, a lady in the office um, who worked in the office saying that he shouldn't have been um, hitting and beating on us as he should and the schools should do something about it you know I'm freaking eight years old and seeing this stuff going on but my mother never came up to the school and said anything but I thought because she didn't know and I wasn't going to tell her looking back I'm sure she smelled the urine on my clothes and everything but it took me years and years to actually tell her. I had to be maybe in high school and I told her and this was um I was anxious to tell her I wanted to because I thought man if my mom knew what he was doing she would have really went up there and um stood up for me and smacked him around maybe you know I wanted her to rescue me so I'm finally all anxious and I finally tell her hey mom you know he that man he used to beat me so hard you know and being making me shame um, shame me in front of people. He even started telling me, um, Miss Alexander, you go to the bathroom and pee first so you don't piss everywhere, you know, once I paddle you. So he would all, and people would be laughing because he'd be like, yeah, you go pee first and you come out here and I got this stick waiting for your butt. I ain't going to get off your butt. I'm waiting for you, but you go pee first. You know, just to totally tormenting me. And so I told her about that and she says, what, you think I didn't know about that? I knew you were peeing on yourself. I knew what was going on. What you you think I didn't know? And I you know what? And how hurt I was. I just couldn't believe it. All those years holding that in that this man was freaking abusing me, thinking that my mother would have done something to him, and she freaking knew the whole time. And I'm thinking, well, dang, if you knew this man was doing this, at least she couldn't even send me a freaking change of clothes to the school. You know, but I, 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 that's one situation of feeling unsafe. Another thing is, um, another situation. I had an uncle, um, who was abusive to some of his girlfriends, to his children, um, meaning to the girlfriends as far as physically beating them up, the children, um, using extension cords or whatever he would use that would, um, tear tear um their skin and they would be bleeding and things of that nature you know and then some of the family at the house even his girlfriend's uh family would be there and everyone would just be in the living room ha ha and laughing and if um one of um the girlfriend's kids did something he would just go in there and freaking beat the crap out of the kids and you could hear them in there screaming for dear life and they would one would come out and then they would be bloody the next one he would beat the next one they would come out bloody and skin open and everybody's still right in the living room laughing like they can't hear how he's beating them and just going on and talking like nothing's going on. 
he would also call um some of my cousin the girls little bees i don't i didn't know what that meant little bees i'm thought, thinking he's talking about actual bees and later i realized no he was calling them you know bees so this stuff was going on and of course i wanted to go over his house because my cousins were there i love spending time with them we would have fun you know so i would have definitely been upset if mom said i couldn't have gone but to look back over it, that she was the adult in that situation should have been that she said no you are not going over there with somebody or we're not going we would just go over there to hang out holidays and not even that that was her best friend she loved him i loved him too but he was abusive so it is what it is but we would go over there constantly on the weekends you know and this is I mean her favorite you know brother you know she, as she said out her own mouth but I guess maybe in her head she thought she was protecting me because when I was a very little kid even before like the age of five I remember her telling him that he was never to put his hands on me and even though he was crazy as hell he did respect that piece. He never did put his hands on me, but he beat the hell out of my cousins and his girlfriends and his, um, uh, her, her kids. It was very, um, abusive, uh, situation. And one issue that I'll never forget with my mother and my uncle, my mother had loaned him some, um, some chairs for, for, you know, for outside for the summer. And she went to pick them up. But he was stalling, so she waited around for him to come to the house. She asked where was her chairs, and he loaned them to someone else. So she went off on him for loaning her chairs out. And we were standing in his living room. Now, it was me standing in the middle, my mother, her brother on opposite sides, and it was a table in the middle of us, and his gun was on the table. My mother's going off on him. Next thing I know, he looks at his gun and making a move like he's going to it. I'm stuck in the middle. At the time, I'm in middle school, like maybe seventh grade. I'm in terror because I'm thinking maybe I should go and grab the gun. Now, I don't know what my head was thinking, if I would try to shoot him or if I would just grab the gun and try to hold it so he wouldn't shoot, you know, shoot my mother. Because even though you grow up in um, abusive environments, you know, it's still your mother you still want to protect you know, your mother, you know, so I, I didn't do anything. And I honestly, I can't remember. I don't know if he actually went for it or held it, but I do remember her leaving at the door saying, I'm telling daddy, you, you were going to shoot me. You were going to shoot me. So I can't remember if he like went for it and act like he was going to grab it. Well, he was there by, he, he got over there to that gun, but he didn't point it at her, even if he picked it up, but still it was a dangerous situation and he was trying, he, he was intimidating her, you know, with that and to do it in front of me was very inappropriate. We didn't go around him for, for a while until, you know, that they end up working that situation. But then when they fixed it, then we end up, um, getting back, um, going back over there into that environment, you know? Um, other situations that I can think of is just my mother's boyfriends, you know, that she would bring into the house that wasn't safe. They never physically abused me or my sisters or anything like that. But it was one guy who came to live with us. He was in jail for years. I mean, he had killed his father. He was living in his father's basement. Somehow they got into an argument. And then um, the father apparently brought the gun down to the basement. My mother's... um boyfriend I don't I guess he was a boyfriend at the time he did it or they were friends I don't know he ends up killing his dad he spent forever in jail my mother um eventually had me and my young sister start going to see this man in prison and I told her I said wait he's gonna live with us when he get out he killed his daddy and she was like oh that's a complicated situation nobody really knows what happened his daddy you know was bothering him in the basement and he had to protect himself but even as a young girl I don't even think I was still in elementary school School, maybe fifth grade when that man came to live with us and I just couldn't believe like this man is coming to live with us and he killed his daddy eventually you know this man didn't have a job nothing he eventually got kicked out of the house because they weren't getting along he ended up drinking some gin she had in, in her um cabinet for years nobody had touched the gin this man drank it she busted him because he was supposed to be um not drinking you know because apparently he was drinking I think when he killed his dad I believe you know so she confronts him this man blames me and my sisters mind you I'm in the sixth grade I'm six years older than the second one my second sister and eight years older than the other he bl he blames us for the gin she knew that that was a lie because if it was a strawberry daiquiri maybe I would she know that I would have snuck into and drank that I love that but uh nah I wasn't doing that 
Another, so he got kicked out. She had another one in there that wasn't so safe. Um, he, um, our house, my mother said on her sewing room, the door, the lock on the window, it kept coming unlocked and she figured someone was probably trying to break in. So she told me the next day I wake up to make sure that it was locked. I made sure it was locked. Me and my sisters went to school. We come home and I believe it was my birthday. I share a birthday with my youngest sister. We come home happy. It's our birthday or whatever. Well, guess what? The house had been broken too. It was only, um, the, they weren't VHS is whatever they used before VHS, um, the, to watch videos and the these big huge video um cassette things well he had sold two of those which were mine and the actual um video player so my mother ended up saying that it was the guy she was dating somehow she knew it was him i think a few days later or something she brings him to us saying he wants to apologize i wasn't big on accepting people's apology to my knowledge and he could have uh, I know he didn't return what he stole. I don't know. He could have paid her in cash. I don't know. It wasn't given to me that knowledge, but I had to go upstairs and I was forced to accept this man's apology, even though I didn't want to, because my thing is, is dude, you've been around us all this time and you freaking come in and break into our apartment. I mean, to our home. What kind, who does that? Well, apparently he does. So those are just some unsafe situations. How do I deal with, um, with dealing with the feeling unsafe? Sometimes it still comes out today. You know, I don't always feel at ease with other people. Like if I don't know them well, I don't feel comfortable with them. And sometimes even when I know people well, something in me it feel it's hard to connect with other people. And a lot of times I didn't know where that came from, but I'm noticing a lot of these symptoms come from when you're abused as a child. You don't really trust people, don't feel safe around them. And it takes a while to let your guard down. Also, I would feel hyper vigilant, not feeling safe, like going outside thinking maybe somebody will attack me. You know, why do I feel this? You know, th this way. Um, you know, even carrying a knife or a mace or scissors in my purse or something feeling just hey if something happened and it's not safe i'm going to be ready you know i was in a mugging situation only once and i don't believe i was traumatized from that but you know i'm always just aware that something can go wrong and i got to be able to protect myself if something goes wrong you know also just feeling uneasy with authority figures you know feeling that um just like i felt like with my mom having to walk on eggshells i mean not walking on eggshells but feeling just nervous around them and you know not wanting to make them mad but i and how i deal with that is to practice being assertive you know standing up for myself if i do find a boss um who is you know overbearing and maybe um you know talking to me or doing something to me that i don't like but those are just some uh situations uh one thing i'll say and i'll end it here is that a daycare i worked at where i really noticed that i had issues with um with being close with other people or intimacy is that my daycare provider says, so Myra, I noticed when the little kids come up to you and they hug you, you don't fully hug them. You just do them like, oh yeah, yeah, like sort of like, yes, get away from me. Okay. And I had to acknowledge that that was true. I didn't feel comfortable with them um, hugging me. Not that I didn't like them. And yes, I, I liked the affection that the kids would show because they had pure hearts, you know. But it was something in me felt uncomfortable reciprocating that love back. So that's something that, um, you know, I have to deal with. And even if someone comes to me or hugs me or um, comes from me from behind, people will say, oh, you jumped. Why you jumped? And people would get like offended, like, oh, well, why you jumped? You don't want me to hug you. And I even had to tell someone, like this guy had hugged me before. And I had to tell, tell people, um, hey, it's nothing personal. It, it's just me. It's not that I don't want the affection. It, it's just me. And, you know, and these things I know go back from childhood. So again, this is narcissistic abuse, not feeling safe. So if you like this video, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell and like the video. And then also go back and watch my other videos and let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you for hanging out. Peace.